Good morning, everyone. You know, um, two years ago, and then specifically one year ago, if you would have told this guy behind me that, yes, you've been at this church longer than most people in the room, but you're actually going to be leading them in worship with your voice, with no electric guitar in front of you, with no acoustic guitar in front of you, trying to figure out what to do with your hands. Um, look at the gift that God's put in this place, right? Um, ben, what's being celebrated there isn't Ben, it's God's gift in you. And I think it's easy to get caught up in the church with what the gifts look like and who has them and who has the most and who's their shiniest and all of those things. Yes, that's all from God. You know, gifts are from God, but men and women make rock stars out of people. But Ben and the teams that are here are full of humility. And I think that's something that makes Newcom very special. And it's something that we're always looking for. And there's been a lot of movement across the entire landscape of the body. And what I mean by the body is those that call this place home. And <coughs> I've seen ministries, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I've seen ministries start up in the last couple of years. I've seen people take major left or right turns with their lives, and there's many things manifesting. And in fact, most of the team up here are people that weren't up here even a year ago because God just keeps delivering. But within the rest, outside of the worship and music realm of our body, there's things happening. We're not just a church moving, and that's the story. The story is the people moving. And I think I'm seeing that more and more in people. And what you may not realize is one of those stories is filled up in the little cups that you put your coffee in, right? So the coffee that you're actually drinking when you come here, I know it sounds maybe trivial to start talking about coffee after that, but what the coffee is connected to is something dynamic because even the coffee you're drinking is the result of God moving in someone's heart saying, okay, well, if our church is moving and if we're going to move down the street and we're going to do a new expression of life and ministry, maybe God wants to do that in, in my life too. God, what would you have me do? And that was what Ryan and Allie Ash started asking God. And so they started looking at their lives, surveying the landscape, and they found that they had connections in Uganda through some people they've been connected with for, what, 10 years? Longer than that now. <clears throat> you know, they have like an adopted son that lives in Uganda that gets them connected to Uganda and through that connected to coffee beans, connected to that doing and starting micro business in Uganda, basically, where you're helping initiate and start up a new life for people on the other side of the world with American dollars. Think about that. And now that coffee is in your cup on a Sunday morning because of someone following what God asked them to do. And so the resource of heart, time, money, vision, all comes from God. And they, Ryan and Allie said, well, let's figure this out then. What's our resource for? Well, it's to fuel the things God wants to do, right? And so if it's a Ben behind a microphone singing songs, looking at the resource of himself, or if it's a Ryan and Allie looking at their lives saying, okay, God, what do you want to do with the resource of us? God's moving. And I think there's probably more of us in here that God wants to do something with. And it doesn't mean it's the same thing you've been doing. It might be, behold, I'm doing a new thing. I don't know. You might. You might lay it before the Lord. Listen, God is a God full of promises. And he's already delivering on that promise in Ryan and Allie's life through this coffee business, which is called Vista Bean, by the way. And there's a lot of things happening in our body that are similar to that. In the coming weeks, you're going to hear more. <clears throat> they're going to travel to Uganda. They're going to come back. And they're going to share with us what they saw, what they heard. And they're going to invite you in to partner with it in prayer. Spiritual community around the ideas, right? Because this isn't a business pitch. This is a spiritual pitch for you to get on board with one another about what God's doing in each other's lives and pray for each other, right? Yeah. 
God is a God who promises, he speaks, he asks us to do things, transitioning into message now, by the way, <laughs> asks us to do things, and it's on us whether we respond or not. Does God ever ask us or tell us something for no reason? No, it's always connected to a greater purpose. Always connected to a greater purpose. You know, the people of God, as we get into this idea of peace today, the people of God had been waiting 700 years by the time the Gospel of Luke picks up the story. 700 years prior to that were the, some of the brightest sparks of a future hope that were delivered through the prophet Isaiah. Almost 700 years. And over those 700 years, the last 400 of them, God never said another word to the people of God. Would you hold fast? Would the way that you hold fast now last for that many generations? That's tough. Tough to answer, right? But they had the promise of God, and they wanted to walk in it, and they wanted to see God's faithfulness in fulfilling it. But over time, the special became ordinary. The truth turned into folklore, right? And isn't that what happens? But God promised me he was going to redeem my family, but it's been 30 years, right? 40 years, 50 years, nothing's happened. The promise of God can turn into legend after time. The sacredness and the specialness of the words of God can become more distant, right? There's dissonance and chaos in waiting for the promise of God to be delivered on. Think about a shepherd boy in a field anointed to be king, but wasn't allowed to be king for a very long time. It's of those same fields where he was anointed that we are going to be preaching, teaching, and learning about today. Those same fields. 700 years ago, these awesome words were spoken in this today. 400 of those, God was silent, and then enter the gospel of Luke. Luke introduces a new age, a new season, a season of fulfillment, and an elaboration on the promise from God. So he's looking back at all of the things that God said, and he's ushering in a new season by representing the story of Jesus with new words, new prophecy, new movement. His goal in writing his book the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke, the book about Jesus, is to open our eyes to see more clearly what God truly meant in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Wonderful counselor, prince of peace, everlasting father, right? He wants to flesh that out for us more and more and more, that for unto us a child is born. Think about the language that we're going to read today. It's 700-year-old language. You know, the idea of novelty and culture and wanting something new is actually part of the modern era, and it's responsible for destroying most of our peace in our lives. I'm going to do something new. No one's done that before. Evaluate your life. What, what drives you more than anything in your world? We're bound by time and space. The, the space and time we live in is ruled by the idea that novelty, something new, something, something different. Luke doesn't point to something new without looking back at what was. There is power in what was. Incredible power. Luke wants us to see that. The prophecies of Isaiah 9-6 are about to get fleshed out, literally. Now, if we were reading the Gospel of John, you'd be like, the word became flesh. Like, he literally fleshes the word out. And Luke is going to do it in his way, and it's eye-opening. 400 years of silence. God had not spoken to the people of God with any fresh revelation. They just kept having to show up to church on Sunday morning. That's not what they were doing. And hoping that something was going to manifest. Something was going to come about that could inspire their curiosity, their wonder, that could anchor their hope again. And they walked in this hoping for the promise. But the tension was so long held that it just turned into folklore, legend, and many many ways. There was distance from the specialness, the sacredness. Then Luke chapter 1 happens. And we'll be in chapter 2 today. And you have this beginning of an age where God starts speaking again to his people 
in Luke. I mean, just read the first two chapters. God talks a lot. So it goes from silence to like he moves in next door and won't shut up. (laughs) If you live next to someone like that, just think about them fondly. Silence is broken. And in the, in the Gospel of Luke, it covers the first chapter, two chapters, cover about roughly 18 months worth of journey. There's a new prophecy about old promises from Isaiah chapter 9. There's a new prophecy, and it's not a, thanks for the prophecy, I'll see you in 400 more years when you fulfill it. It's No, I'll see you in nine months when you fulfill it, because the first prophecy is about John the Baptist, right? And Elizabeth is old and barren, as it's represented, a common biblical theme, believe it or not. And God works a miracle. Hmm. The waiting was a little different this time. God was saying this was going to happen, and it happened. And this, this John was going to be something special, something different. This John was going to prepare the way for another one that was to come. And so there was another prophecy happening just down the road to a woman named Mary. And this is Luke chapter 1, just synopsizing high level. And those promises were these, that you will bear a son and he will be all of those titles, right? The Isaiah 9 titles. It doesn't list those there. But it hearkens to all of them. Wonderful counselor, prince of peace. But he will be the savior. So you have prophecy coming out of nowhere. Angelic visitation coming out of nowhere, bursting onto the scene. And in 18 months, you have a prophecy about John being born and he's born. Then you have a prophecy about Jesus being born and we'll look at it today. He will be born. But not only that, prophecy is not just coming from heaven, but it's coming out of the mouths of people just like us. Because Mary sings a prophetic song after she hears it. And then Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, sings a prophetic song that points to what his son will do, but also what this Jesus will accomplish. How cool is that? 400 years of silence, and the silence is broken from heaven to earth in the most dynamic of ways through angels and through humans responding to the goodness of God, and song and prophetic movement and utterance is breaking out everywhere. I mean, you can believe that that stuff doesn't happen, but you're missing out on, like, all of the cool colors on the page. Seriously. You know, one of the questions I wrestle with when I'm, I'm reading through this, and I always ask myself like a handful of questions every time, otherwise I'm not fully taking the journey, is like, am I living my life looking for the fulfillment of God? Because this was new prophecy, new fulfillment. The waiting was different. God was more imminent in all of these promises in Luke 1. God was going to speak and do, and speak and do, and speak and do. And when Jesus spoke, that was God speaking. And when Jesus did, that was God doing. Think about that. That's pretty incredible, right? Like, we were in the age, we're in the age of fulfillment of all of the prophecies about God, all the prophecies about Jesus, right? Until Jesus comes back, we are in the age where the door is open for anyone that would want to come to the Father through Jesus. The door is open now. And that's because of the word of God being fulfilled through Jesus. This is where we are. This is who we are. That's where peace comes from. Is this Jesus, the prince of what? Peace, prince of peace. I like that it's prince because it's like the prince has a lot more energy than like the old king. (laughs) Like he's going to labor. We got this guy like he's got the energy to lead the movement. You know, peace cost him everything, didn't it? It was a bit of a young man's job. Physically, emotionally, dependence wise, not having all the answers he needed all the time, having to depend on the father. There's a lot there for us. You know, am I living looking for fulfillment? Like, where have I forgotten the promise of the word of God? Where have I turned to my own words? Where do I feel like it's been 400 years? Where am I exhausted by the process of God's timing? Because God's timing ruins me. Because it's supposed to. 
where am I taking the promise of God and trying to manifest it on my own even? When I was young, learning how to teach, Summer and I were talking. I don't like talking about like accomplishments often, and I don't think it's an accomplishment. It's more like testimony to the favor of God and his faithfulness, I guess, more is by June of 2023, it'll be 25 years of me teaching in churches, and for Derek too, probably. 25 years, I'm 42 years old. Like, who put me on a stage? What was wrong with those people? Because the person I was was someone that was taking the promise of God and trying to manifest it in my own way many times through teaching, through leading, through title, through role. You know, I got to look for God's fulfillment, not by rushing what I've heard and trying to accomplish my own agendas. And I've also got to look for God's fulfillment and not get worn out by the process of waiting for that fulfillment. And so I had to ask myself those questions, right? This is the culture in which these new prophecies land. People are waiting for God. And they're probably worn out by it. It doesn't say that, but I can assume because I breathe air too. That's probably what they were feeling. God's promises are his to deliver in his way, in his time, for his purpose, and for his glory, not yours. Period. Listen, if I'm taking glory from anything God does, whoops. Whoops. Actually says in scripture, he will not share his glory with anyone. How do you come against that? So you get into this Luke chapter two now. You've had prophecy, you've had from angels, you've had prophetic song from a Mary and from a Zechariah. You've had a John the Baptist born, and then six months later we land in the journey with Mary. And Joseph. Luke chapter 2, 1 through 20. We'll just read it through. It'll be on the screen. You can see how bad I am at reading. In those days, a, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. So some things haven't changed. Syria, Assyria, they're all still there from the old covenant. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee to the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of the lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. We hit the next slide there, Dory. And while they were there in Bethlehem, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Changes scenes. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not, Behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. I love that it's like this day. It's like this isn't folklore. This isn't just legend. This isn't just story. This just isn't like some sort of prophecy. Sorry, I'm preaching for a second here. Like this is happening in time and space now. Something is manifesting now. This is what the angel says, unto you, born this day in the city of David. Talk about immediate prophecy, right? Because we know what these guys do right after this. Prophecy fulfillment. Prophecy fulfillment. This is a new age. In the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign for you. You'll find him wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God, saying... Next. Is that right? Oh, did I just copy two wrong? So, glory to God in the highest. I told you. You got to watch this stuff with me. And on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. And when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. 
And they went with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby laying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at, the, at what the shepherds told them. But Mary just switches scenes again, treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. I think it's important to read the story a little bit. It's pretty incredible because we are, we are the ones, like I said the first week, we are the ones that keep this sacred. We hold the ground on that, right? Culture turns it into Hallmark cards. We keep it God's and we make it God's and we worship God for it, right? Luke 2, just the very first verses here. In those days, it says a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the world would be registered, and this was the first res re regist registration. Well, Quirinius was govern governor of Syria, and all went to be registered. So what was happening in this specific time is that everybody needed to go back to where their family tree led them, all the way back to the roots of their family tree. And they were going to be registered where those families had come from. So the roots of your family line is where you needed to, to return because the government wanted to understand more about how they could do their job. And this is literally all these details, Caesar Augustus, the first reg registration, Quirinius, the governor of Syria, and being registered, those kind of like political descriptors that we get in scripture often point to the beginning of, uh, in, in like even the book of Ezra, right? It referenced a governor, a ruler who was going to pronounce an edict and something was going to happen as a result of it. And then the underlying statement under all of it was like, yes, during all that time when God was actually in charge of them calling all of this stuff, because we needed a certain someone to wind up a certain somewhere so that prophecy could be fulfilled. Remember, God's in charge of all of this. All of it. So there's names here listed, but those names are just like water in the hand of God. He can move those guys' leadership any which way he wants to. And that's what we taught when we went through Ezra, that God holds all of it. God can move the leaders around. God can be behind these things. So biblical hearers, Old Testament readers of this text in Luke would interpret it that way. Okay, if we're hearing of government, we're hearing of places and leaders and orders that are being put on the people of God, then we know that we're about to hear how God was actually in control of all of it. And I think about that in contrast to us when we hear this or when we hear things about our government. I think our, our noses are always sniffing for ways to disqualify God from being active in it because we prefer to invent two worlds because it's easier to point fingers at what governments do than it is to be active in changing things. It's easier to bail on the education system because you don't believe in the things that, the, that you're teaching. It's easier to bail on a church because you don't believe they're living as right as they could. It's harder to get involved in the middle of it and bring about reform. And that is a slow death I would rather die than getting out of the mix of it and pointing fingers. For the Old Testament hearer of this story, they're not like, oh gosh, Caesar Augustus, you know, oh, stupid registration. These guys are morons. Let's write about it on Facebook. I'm just saying, <laughs> like, for me, they're not looking at that. They're like, oh my gosh, this has all the makings of God's about to do something, right? Don't lose your wonder in the fact that God's got things. There's some incredible teachers in this room that haven't bailed on the education system because it's difficult. They're changing lives and they're finding favor because God is actually in charge. Don't forget it. Don't forget it. Hmm. I also think in contrast to some of, some of the theme of the day, I'll try to keep it on peace as much as I can is that there's this endless suspicion we all wrestle with that leads to chaos in our lives, doesn't it? I don't read in the text that Joseph was like, well, you know that those government officials, they're up to something, I'm not going. You don't read that in the text. Maybe he felt it, I'm not sure, it's all hearsay. But it wasn't worthy enough of showing up in the text. 
The more important thing is this, that they were going somewhere that was important in the story of God, Luke 2, 4 to 5. And it says this, that Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, and he went to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was also with child. So the city of David is typically referenced as Jerusalem, but David's father's name was Jesse. And Jesse, if you go all the way back to scripture, you find out about Jesse, that Jesse in 1 Samuel, and we'll hit it way later in the text this morning, that Jesse was the father of David. And Jesse is referred to as a Bethlehemite. He's from Bethlehem, five miles outside of Jerusalem, in the shepherding community, just on the hills outside. Isaiah 11.1 1 says this, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of who? Jesse. And a branch from his roots shall bear fruit, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, and might, knowledge, and of the fear of the Lord. Go to the next one. Verse 10 says this, In that day, the root of Jesse... Uh, in that day, the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and, of, and his resting place shall be glorious. You have these like prophetic utterances about the root of Jesse happening 700 years before this. Jesse the Bethlehemite. Jesse the one whose town was Bethlehem. This same town that now Joseph of the lineage of Jesse now needs to go because he's chosen to be fully in and adopt this kid. So they go. And in doing so, Micah 5.2, But you, O Bethlehem, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one who is the ruler of Israel, who's coming forth is from old, from ancient days. Isn't that crazy? So now you have this Joseph, who is like the, quote, father, the adopted father of Jesus, who chooses to go, and now they have to be registered under him because he plans to be with Mary, even though she's pregnant without him understanding that. We'll get that in one second. All of a sudden, Joseph becomes the connection to David, Bethlehem, Jesse, biblical prophecy. I mean, imagine this radically uncomfortable situation, having a woman pregnant by the Holy Spirit. And in the Gospel of Luke, Joseph gets no cred at all. He gets nothing. They don't talk about Joseph almost at all. In Matthew, like, he gets a special visitation from an angel that helps him be okay with things. But even that, like, I would have more questions than answers. I'll be like, well, you told me that much. Can you tell me the rest? God doesn't do that, does he? Why? Why would he do that? He wants to work it out in relationship with us. Matthew 1 says that Joseph wanted to call it off, call off the marriage in secret. Makes sense. But the story would have taken a swift end. And in his distress, like I said, God sends him an angel. And what does he comfort him with? 700-year-old words from Isaiah 7. Powerful. There's great power in knowing the truth and faithfully standing in it. And Joseph held fast. And I think this leads to peace. I think his disposition was, well, we got to go there. I know you're with child. We have a million excuses to not go there, but we have to go there. And so they went obediently, and then they find themselves fulfilling biblical prophecy. Imagine if they were suspicious like many of us are. No, oh, God's not in this. God's not in governments. God's not in systems. God can't do that. This story wouldn't be real. And I would suggest this, that there's nothing miraculous or practical about any of this. It's all practical, honest obedience, isn't it? Just super 
practical obedience. And I would say this, we're always hunting for miracles. God doesn't need them. The miracle's for us. God doesn't need them. Do I want to see more of them? Yes, please, God. Please. And I mean that wholeheartedly. But I think we do see them. I think the most incredible miracles that take place in this life take place in the heart. Think about who you were. Think about what Tanya said. Who she was, but who she is. You ever try to change the course of the own river, of the river of your own life? Impossible. God can. God does. God will. The most incredible miracles that take place are the ones in the heart, the place where God changes the course of a river inside of us, from bitter to pure, from hard to soft, closed to open, from unforgiving to forgiving, from fear to love, and here's my favorite, from entitlement to gratitude, probably the one we all wrestle with the most. But I've earned it. These are the greatest miracles you will ever see in your own life, period. I mean, and I've, I've seen a lot in ministry, I saw a withered hand come completely back to life, but then that person died at 85 years old like the rest of us, 100 years old, whatever it is. So it's a temporary fix. You change something spiritual, that's, that's miraculous. You change a heart, that's miraculous. It's a lot harder work, though. It's a lot less pyrotechnics and cool outside like, oh, wow, smoke and lights. It's hard work changing the heart. Only God can do it. God can soften, but he can harden as well. But God can soften the heart. I think it's so important for us to realize that these are the greatest miracles you will ever see in your own life, period. But I want the other ones too. Don't get me wrong. I think all of the prophecy that you saw in all of Scripture from 700 years, and there's more before Isaiah, but let's just go back to only that far, boils down to a moment of practical obedience and self-sacrifice, and then God manifests the fulfillment of his prophecy. I want that in my own life too, right? God's spoken to me things over my family, and if I don't obey, I'm the conduit. I'm going to reroute the system. We're going to be in a million detours. Old plumbing. Luke 2, 6 to 7. So here they are in, in Bethlehem. And listen to how uneventful and undecorated this passage is. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Done. Fascinating, huh? Super simple. Super simple. All the prophecy, Old Testament, New Testament, all the buildup, all of this boils down to like two sentences. The other gospels make it more beautiful. Companies make it even more beautiful. Like you, you couldn't design a cool t-shirt based off this description or sell nativity scenes based off this description. In Luke, there's no moonlight breaking through the roof and cool snowflakes in the air and wise men throwing gifts all over Jesus, burying him under gifts. There's none of that in Luke. In fact, his point is that this is a fulfillment story. And Jesus' earthly glory is unnecessary for what he needs to accomplish. And can I tell you this? If you want to lose peace in your life, believe that you need earthly glory for God to do what he wants to do. If you want to lose your peace, it ain't going to happen. If you want peace in your life, then take the same road that Jesus did and have full dependence on the Father because foundation on anything else is going to lead to broken life. There's some emotion behind that for me. I've, I've chosen the wrong way and the right way, willfully both sides. I think it's awesome. There's no glory here in the Jesus was born. It was like, yeah, they were there, so they gave birth. Because yeah, there's no room at the inn, like they, you know, they put him in a manger. Luke 2, 8 through 9, the story shifts. It's when the story changes, you start to see the birth being decorated with spiritual, supernatural, prophetic happenings in a field to those who had no real place to lay their heads or means of great influence to shepherds. And I'm not going to over-magnify shepherds as these 
lowest of the earth kinds of people. I don't think it's necessary for the story. Luke 2, 8 through 9, it said, In the same region where Jesus was born, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. I would be too. This was before the light bulb. So having light shine all around me in a field at night would be pretty sketchy. But do you remember, I referenced 1 Samuel 16, and that was about Jesse being a Bethlehemite. And when David, his son, was anointed king, they couldn't find him. Where was he? In the fields tending to sheep. What fields was David in? Tending to sheep. Probably the same types of fields. But this time someone else is getting anointed, not David. Isn't it cool that God works through these old channels? Throw away structures and throw away all that stuff. Like, God works through all this stuff. Mary and Joseph being connected to the lineage of Jesse. Elizabeth and Zechariah were in the lineage of Aaron, the high priest, the originals. God works through these things. He's still working through the Jews today. He's working through us as, you know, Christians, as those grafted in that are Gentiles that believe in God through Christ. He's working through all of it. He's going to continue using those systems. And to fight with the way that God works is going to cause chaos, not peace. Peace comes through being on board with the way that God's chosen to operate. So be willing and open to hear what he wants to tell you, what he wants you to do. You're significant in the story, not for glory's purpose, but for his use, for his glory. You're significant in that. They're in the field and... These angels appear. The word for appeared is awesome. It like, it's this word that's like suddenly, they, it was just amongst them. And they're like, ah. So they were afraid. And it says the glory of the Lord immersed them in God's light in a sense. It's in the language. And they were filled with great fear. You know, it's crazy. When Samuel went to anoint David in the fields, the elders from the town of Bethlehem came out and saw Samuel coming to anoint David, and you know what it says about the elders? That they were filled with great fear. Why is the prophet coming to our town? And here an angel shows up to anoint a different king, and they're filled with great fear again. Be afraid for God to move, for sure, but be willing to step into it. Like when he shows you more of yourself, the picture ahead can be scary, but it's good. It's good for you. The angel repeats Isaiah 9, 6, but we'll look at it through the lens of Luke 2, 10 and 11. The angel said to them, Fear not, behold, I bring you good news of great joy for all the people unto you born this day in the city of David, a Savior, who is Christ, the Lord. Cool names, we'll hit them in a second. This will be a sign for you. You'll find the baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. Hmm. Those words, for you, unto you is born this day. Where did we hear those? Isaiah. I mean, it said it through Isaiah first. It's saying it through an angel now. He's even using the same words. He's used the same people and peoples and their lineages. And he's using the same words that he's always used. God is the same yesterday, today, and what? Forever. It's where we're going forever. Get on board with what he's doing. Ditch the idea of crazy novelty that leads to chaos and trust that the God that said all this stuff is going to continue to say this stuff in your life to you and the things that you're doing and has more for you in the future. And this is actually where you land. Still in the hand of God. Trust. Lean into this. Lean into the ways of God, the way of Jesus. That's what this is about. It's not an us versus them even in the world. It's just us with God. He's the one that makes the way. So important for us to realize. And so he shares this. The angel shares this with the shepherds and gives three names for Jesus. Savior, Christ, and Lord. 
Now, when it says, I bring good news of a savior, that was common for any emperor or any leader. That was pronounced over them. Anytime an emperor had a successor, these were things that were sung and said about a Roman emperor or about any sort of great leader that was supposed to come, that they would be seen as a savior. In other words, the kingdom has been established for a longer time. We have an heir. I love the subversiveness in scripture where they're like, cool, we'll use that because we have a better version. His name's Jesus. But it's also the same word used in the book of Judges. Every time a new judge or king was raised up to lead, they were called saviors or deliverers. So you're getting another Old Testament reference. Who's this message probably for, most of all? The Jews. It's for Israel. This is who the tiding of comfort and joy is for. Like you're in another era where you're going to be in a golden age like you've never seen before. And you'll have some new neighbors. Gentiles. It's not shared here yet. The baby was identified as a savior, a deliverer, but also as Christ. The Greek word here is, it means anointed one, anointed by God. So the angels are saying there's an anointed one. And this points to him being a Messiah. And actually even the Hebrew word Messiah means anointed one. So there's like no confusing it. Like this is the one. This is the guy you've been waiting for. For 700 years, and after 400 years of silence, and after him speaking a lot in these last 18 months or so that are covered here. Savior, deliverer, anointed one, and Lord. The word there is kurios, which is Lord, but it means authority and lordship. So this guy has absolute authority and absolute lordship. Again, you want to step outside of peace? You try and be the kurios when you have an absolutely nothing. No absolute authority, no absolute lordship in your life. Sorry. A lot of stewardship, not a lot of lordship. And essentially the close of this section, or this verse says, you'll find the baby wrapped in swaddling cloths. In other words, go see for yourself. You'll find him, don't worry about it. So they're in the field, they can only go one place to find a baby. They go into the town. And suddenly there was a great multitude after this, verse 13. And we're getting there quick. Don't worry, guys. And there was a host, a heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those whom, with whom he is pleased. And the, the like Greek behind this is cool. It's basically saying all credit, the angels show up. They're suddenly there. They're singing at the, in the field with the, with the shepherds who were freaked out but are now sort of acclimating to the environment. And they say, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. It basically is saying, credit be to God for all of his glory. And it's like those that are in heaven are rejoicing and marveling at this great work that only God himself could do. They're giving God glory for it. They're worshiping him for allowing this to happen. Like, oh my gosh, for eternity, we've been hanging out with Jesus because he's been there from the beginning. You put a body on him, and now we're going to be watching him live a life and breathe air like these ones that don't know what it's like to be in heaven? But that's your plan, God? They must have known. They had to know. Because they're glorifying God in advance for the work that's coming. Why all this hubbub if it was going to die in 24 hours, 48 hours, two months? No. Something was beginning that was going to be completed. And heaven was singing of something that's eternal that was happening. It says the word peace, right? Glory to God. And on earth peace among those with whom he's pleased. The word peace there is actually straight out of Old Testament. It's shalom. But the shalom isn't what we make it in our modern context, this peace, this idea of wellness and wholeness. It, it here is alluding to something more gravitational. And I know all of us long for peace and want to have peace and order in our lives and reach to establish that constantly. I do, all the time. But this is actually kind of widening your worldview on what peace is, is that what God was accomplishing is something that's even bigger than your deep desire for you to feel peace in your life. God was bringing about an order within all created things that were going to be reordered and made new again through Jesus. 
And as a result of that, you will have peace. Not, once I have peace, I'll be fine and let God take care of his things. No, we're interconnected. We're part of creation. We are also what will be made new. The newness is what changes everything. That this one is bringing peace on earth among those with whom he is well pleased. In other words, he's going to bring order to all things. And you will taste that. Not, could you just give me peace because like financially I'm out of control right now, God. And yes, but that's not primary. Primary is the one that made the world is remaking the world. And it happened through Jesus. It's a new thing. Behold, this is the new thing that scripture talks about. God didn't eliminate the chaos in that moment at all. And he still hasn't. But he sent Jesus to become the doorway to true peace. Eventually, there will be peace in God's fullest expression, not your definition, not mine. And I would say if peace is about you being fulfilled so you can rest, then that's probably not peace. That sounds more like preference. If peace is about you trusting and waiting and resting in him for his fulfillment of his promises and settling down and being ordered by trust, ordered by waiting, ordered by resting in him, that's probably something closer to what biblical peace is, is that you've subbed out the lordship back to God. And that's what God wants for us. One little quick note before I start to wrap up here. The first two chapters of the Gospel of Luke, this is just an observation that I think is important for us, and then I'll kind of talk about Mary in a second here. We are so starved to just rationalize and internalize things in our minds, in our culture, right? We're so method-driven. Like, well, if it doesn't follow the rules of logic, then it's not truth. I'm like, I don't know. Pretty sure God was around before what we call truth, how we identify things. God is absolute, real truth. Now, is truth for God the same as truth for me? Well, it has to be. We can find truth, but it comes from God, not us. But one of the responses to God's inbreaking action and bringing his truth and bringing his fulfillment in the Gospel of Luke is this, over and over and over again. And it kind of hijacks the, the prison of the mind a little bit. Go through and read this week, Luke 1 into 2, until verse 20. How many times do you see people breaking out in song? How many prophetic words and utterances do you see? These things overwhelm the rational mind and wake up the heart. And I would encourage you, another way to be disconnected from peace is to believe that rational thought is the highest level of giving yourself to God. That sometimes you just need to fall on your face and cry out and praise to God about the things he's doing irrationally. Sometimes you need to bust out in prophetic song and write it down and share it with nobody if you don't want to feel weird or share it with the world. I'm sure these Mary and Zechariah weren't planning on having us read this this morning. Do you make room for that responsiveness to God? Because it is, if this is all we had of scripture is just these two, ver these two chapters, like period, we would probably do this all the time because it would be all we had. Because this just constantly happens. Responsive, poetic, prophetic, song. The angels leave. Luke 2, 15. And the shepherds go... They say, all right, let's get our stuff together. Let's go check it out. Luke 2, 16 through 18. They went and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby in a manger. And when they saw it, the child, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. 
The word wonder there is to kind of awe towards something, to be in responsiveness to it in a positive way. I read this with my American mind sometimes, and I'm like, and all who heard it wondered, hmm, at what the shepherds said. Let's test the spirits, which is good. But like, where is the room to just wholeheartedly believe in what God's doing? I would rather be a child first in my response in some of those things and then an adult second. So don't miss out on something God might be doing. They were filled with wonder. But Mary is in the corner, it almost sounds like. I'm reading that into the text, so omit that from the record. Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. This isn't the first time she's done this, by the way. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God. There it is again, song. For all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. Listen to those responses. Treasured up in her heart, pondering. Shepherds glorifying and praising. Must have been a powerful sermon when those, pre- those um, shepherds broke into that house and said, oh my gosh, that kid over there in the manger? And everyone's like, there's a kid in the manger? Oh my gosh, who put the kid in a manger? <laughs> There was no room at the end. It's not our fault. They share this, and Mary sits, and she's just just given birth. She's exhausted, depleted, right? She treasures treasures it up in her heart. You know, if I'm at a soccer game and someone's talking about my kid on the field, and they don't know I'm listening, or they don't know I'm his dad, and they're saying good things, I'm treasuring that stuff up. I'm like, heck yeah, he's the best in the world ever. (laughs) But imagine being the mother of the son of God and hearing that angels showed up for your kid's birth out in the fields. These are postures of like hope and peace for sure, right? Treasuring it up in your heart. I come to church on Sundays to treasure stuff up in my heart from God. Some of those things are you guys when you tell me your stories. Richard, you're one today. Welcome. Like, that's crazy, right? Treasure it. There's a lot of stories. Pondering. Theologically curious. Oh, my gosh, God, what are you really doing? It's okay. Glorifying, praising. These things lead to peace. They lead to peace. I guess the big question of the morning before we go out and have a meal and I get, after I get through my sticky is this. Fulfillment. Are you looking for God's fulfillment in all things? Not for you to be fulfilled in how you see it. Because I feel like God's fulfillment is what actually brings peace when I'm waiting for him to fulfill promise to my family, promise to me, Promise from scripture in my life. Like That's what I want to see. That leads to peace. He has promises. He will fulfill them. We know that. Scripture says, he who began the good work, right? Faithful to complete it. Maybe you haven't even opened the dialogue with God to know what his promise for you would even be. But man, I pray about my kids every single day of my life. And sometimes I hear from God and I watch over my kids' lives like a shepherd on a field waiting to see the good things come to them that I think God wants to do. And maybe we need a little bit more of that, right? There's peace in that. There's peace in because it's on God. We're not the Lord. We're the steward. He's the one that works and moves. He's the one that brings the new. He's the one that brings about the things that were mentioned 700 years before this. He's the one who brings life and peace and restores the world to him. We can rest because he's got it all. That's peace, right? That's peace. Father, we're um, asking for your hands today to be upon us as we try and discern this, God. Try and discern what you mean in all of these messages for us each week and this morning as well. I just want to rest in you. I I want to say thank you, God, 
for giving us a season every year where we can focus on these things of you, your entry into this world. And we just ask right now, God, that you fill us with the spirit of your love where we have community together, eating a meal together. And we're grateful. Thank you for Jesus, God. Thank you for Jesus. In Christ's name. Number one. Christmas Eve is happening on December 24th. Number two, I'm kidding, um, at four o'clock, right? It's usually an hour, four to five, birth to f- five, to five-year-olds, um, child care. It's more family-oriented in here as well, just so you know. It's like a giant sandbox. Just come and bring your fan. Adopt-a-family is done. We look forward to sharing with you the result of everything God put in you to put into it. And then last but not least, we have a meal prepared for us to share um, hanging out um, outside. And um, in the new year, we'll probably get back to having more conversation after messages. Right now, we're kind of putting a meal together at the end of things. But love you guys, and we'll see you outside. Get some food. God, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to worship you as a body, as a community. We come here with expectation that you have something in store. So Lord, we say that we're ready for you. Help us to be sensitive to your spirit. Help us to hear you clearly. And all that we say and do, Lord, may it be worship and pleasing here. We're excited to see what you have in store. We love you, Lord. Amen. Let's worship together. You know it. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Hold your head up high. Don't fear no evil. Fix your eyes on this one true. God is badly in love with you. Take courage, hold on.
got a word for us this morning. He's going to lead us in communion. If you haven't had a chance, there are stations to get communion cups around the sides and around the back. Good morning, Nuka. When I was asked to come and uh, talk about communion, I uh, spent a lot of time in prayer about what I wanted to say. Um, I always thought it was such a, an amazing honor to be asked, and my heart was postured to do right by the Lord's word. And so communion is so very important to me for the reason that I lived one way and then I lived another my first life, I didn't know Jesus, and I walked in the world, and I was of the world, and by the time I had come to know Jesus, I was broken, beaten, lost, sad, and pretty much didn't want to live at all. And when I was brought to church and started listening to the passages about how much the Lord loved me, my heart started to believe that there was someone out there named Jesus who did these amazing, beautiful things for me. In Isaiah 53, 5, it says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be made whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. When I took those words into my heart, how could I stay the same? How could I be the same person, knowing the depth of his love and what he did for me? He loved me so much that he provided a way for us, for me, to come to the cross anytime I needed. And it was through communion, with community. 1 John 1, 7 proclaims, but if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. He changed me. He changed my heart. And this cup represents every time I come to the cross how he's changing me and using me loving me. In this time of remembrance, I'm also reminded that when I struggle to come to him and come to the cross and admit my failures and my defeats, he's given me a community to help me. 1 Corinthians, and though we are many, we all eat from one loaf of bread. We who are many are one body for we all share the one loaf. So as you take your communion today, in your heart, if you can think how much loving Jesus and his love for you has changed you, that's all I can ask for. Thank you. Things have passed away, but your love has stayed the same. Your constant grace remains the cornerstone. 
things that we thought were death are breathing in life again. You cause your sun to shine on darkest night. For all that you've done, we will pour out our love. This will be
Father, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your ever gracious giving. At this time of year, we celebrate the, you giving your son. The child had to be born, but the son existed. The son just needed to be given for us. So, Father, with that, we thank you for all that you do for us. Regardless of whether or not we realize it, Father, we thank you. We need you. And we pour out our affections on you today. May you be with us as we continue to worship you today. May you be with Justin as he speaks and fill his words. Um, give him your words. Give him your voice, Father. We thank you for all that you are. In Jesus' name. <laughs> 